Thanks, Melody. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining. What I'm going to do is take just a minute and share with you some of the reasons why we think this session matters. Because we're big believers as SG Innovate in the importance of working with entrepreneurial scientists to help them bring what they're working on out to the market. So in a nutshell, the whole reason that SG Innovate was formed and the whole reason we exist is to be useful to entrepreneurial scientists. And I say entrepreneurial scientists because not everybody wants to be entrepreneurial and not everybody can choose to be entrepreneurial. But for those that would like to make that choice, we want to be helpful. Our goal is not to alter the science. Our goal is to help people build a company. So we know how to build companies, and scientists know their science. And if we can work together, hopefully we can do some good things. A lot of evolution has occurred in the last couple of years in the Singapore ecosystem and around the world. I just came back yesterday from University of Cambridge in the UK. Some always great things happening there. But here's the point. They're interested in collaborating more with us, meaning with Singapore. And same thing in Vietnam, same thing in Australia, where we signed an agreement yesterday afternoon with the science and research organization of the Australian government. So deep tech, which we would define as something that has a scientific core. We don't identify it as it must be AI or it must be med tech. We say if there's a scientific core, if the barrier to entry is high, if it's more founded in the lab, not in the dorm room, those are things that we would generally call deep tech. We can always discuss whether it is or it is not, but those are little guidelines that we would think of ourselves. Now, Eugene Fitzgerald, who's here with me as the CEO of SMART, is a friend and a partner because we think that a lot of what MIT and SMART are doing here in Singapore matters, and we want to try and see some of that great science reach the market. Eugene is also a pioneer and an entrepreneur himself in addition to his current work as the founder of several different companies. And so Eugene's able to bring a really important perspective, both of the science and of the entrepreneurship. But we don't really know who's in the room today, so we don't know how many people would define themselves as engineers or scientists or PIs or whatever other thing. So just so that we can get a sense of who's who, can I just ask for people that would define themselves in one of these sort of broad categories to raise their hand? OK, that means almost nobody. So what we'll do then is we'll talk a little bit about why we think this thing called deep tech matters, why it matters to Singapore, why it matters to Asia, why it matters to the world. But importantly, think about it, and we were just chatting a moment ago. The way that we look at it is everything that you would define today, almost everything that you would define today, has some origination in this area that we would call deep tech. When you think about all the apps, and the valuation of Snapchat or the valuation of CrowdStrike, any of these things that are currently hot on Wall Street right now are based on compute capability, communication capability, things that wouldn't exist without the, the work and the research from people such as Bell Labs 40 and 50 and 60 years ago. So part of our challenge is, while starting companies is cool, if there's more ride-sharing apps and there's more restaurant reservation apps, that's not going to make a material difference to some of the tough challenges facing humanity. Shortage of food supplies, misallocation of healthcare resources, energy, lots of different things. So we would argue that deep tech is really important, has been, is, and will continue to be important. So that's why we wanted to have this discussion. So I've got Eugene here with me. Here's the question that I'm going to ask of you. We can talk to each other anytime, and we would like to have this conversation be more than us. We want it to be including you. So here's what I'm going to do. Slido, for those that like to use Slido. But I think the easiest thing is just the good old-fashioned technology of raise your hand, and we'll have somebody bring a microphone to you. Please engage, because if you're not asking questions of Eugene or me, whatever you want to do, then we're going to miss some of the opportunity. Because I can go have a coffee with Eugene anytime I want. For him to be in front of you and for you to have a chance to ask him questions is something that I think is an opportunity not be missed. So please, don't just uh, sit there and listen to us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with Eugene. Do you want to introduce yourself to the crowd that may not know you and a little bit about your background? And then we'll jump in. Sure. Uh, well, uh, 
I guess uh, my first job in science, you know, because what we're talking about here is connecting science to the market, was at a place that no longer exists. It was AT&T Bell Laboratories, where you could work for decades on problems uh, to solve them. And you know, we could talk later about, about the ecosystem and how it's changed. Uh, but from there, I learned that uh, one problem with AT&T was you couldn't finish that process. You couldn't uh, get things to market that easily. And we discovered something very important. And so um, I moved back to MIT. And then years later, when the Singapore program started here, so SMART is MIT's research enterprise in Singapore. So I first came here in 1998, really because I said, look, we're innovators uh, in semiconductors and integrated circuits. And if we're not in Asia, um, there's a problem there because the, the, the supply chain's there, the manufacturing's there, and it turns out um, the rest is history. You know, I grew more and more into the Singapore ecosystem, and when we had the opportunity to create SMART, which is a collaborative uh, enterprise, meaning that every single project is integrated to someplace else also in Singapore. So NUS, NTU, what we do is we put large programs together so that then we can spend five, 10, and longer years trying to uh, bring deep ideas, deep tech, uh, all the way to Singapore economy, addressing global markets, hopefully. That's kind of what, what we want to do. So that's a quick, a quick summary of my passion, too. OK, so when we think about startups, entrepreneurship, finding the right talent, finding investors, finding customers, these are always challenges. We'll be competing against the stage next door, but I was that's okay. Say, there we go. Uh, these are always challenges. But in deep tech, they're bigger because it's harder for a customer to adopt something that's called deep tech. It takes longer for an enterprise to make a decision than it does for an individual consumer. Talent, it's harder to find somebody to work in machine learning or deep learning than it is to find somebody who's a web developer. So there's general challenges with deep tech. And part of what we're trying to do is think about how to help with that journey. So maybe share a little bit about your own journey of being both a researcher and then also an entrepreneur. OK. Uh, well, probably something you can all relate to is um, uh, be, a lot of you probably work in companies, right? So um, at AT&T, even though we had this great thing called Bell Labs, uh, me and a colleague, we uh, discovered something really important. Uh, at uh, over 200 degrees uh, below zero, right? And so it was a physics event, but what it said was that uh, you could actually build silicon circuits with, with much higher mobility, which means that uh, you could actually build more advanced ICs, um, and all the big players would probably have to follow and get that technology. So we were all excited by that. But um, I think Steve could relate to this. In those days, you know, it wasn't like you were supposed to take ideas like that and then go out to the world. You were supposed to do it through the company. So probably like much of you have experienced, you got a new idea, I go to the marketing and sales, and it turns out, of course, all the marketing and sales guys are interested in the thing they're selling currently. They're not interested in the future, right? I see smiles in the audience, so I know you've experienced this. <laughs> so. Uh, but, you know, I was a stubborn uh, young guy then. I, I still think I'm young. <laughs> but anyway, so I, uh, I tried to, to do everything I could. And then um, with the change in the ecosystem, I realized that, um, you know, things weren't going to happen in that uh, company. Of course, eventually AT&T, as we know, it disappeared. The AT&T you see today is not the AT&T from back then. It's a different company, actually. But anyway, uh, went back to MIT. And with my first grad students, to show you it is possible, uh, we, we started to, to chip away every day at the next thing that um, uh, was blocking us from a technical point of view. Now, while we were doing that, we were constantly talking to outside companies. And this is one of the things, I guess, you know, advice to, to scientists. We were not working in a vacuum, huh, so to speak. Uh, we were, we were uh, interacting with the outside world constantly. One of the reasons when I went back to MIT, I was worried that uh, I would lose connection, actually. To, cause I saw in at t how fortunate it was we could talk to people that made everything from transistors to telecom systems, right? So I needed that connection. So uh, because of that, we were able to steer the research, eventually made a startup company, and 
this is a very, very long story. There was another, another 10 years after that, and Intel um, licensed the technology eventually, and then TSMC, a, a, a foundry in Taiwan, bought the rest of it to have parity with, with that. So that's a quick jump forward, but I want to say that uh, in the middle, uh, while I was here in Singapore, just to show you how it's, it's the ecosystem here evolves over time and you make friends, um, there's somebody in the audience today, I see him. He uh, works with me at Lee's, which is our new thing that we're doing in Smart to try to impact the future integrated circuits. And it turns out he was the first guy on the ground here for our little startup company doing R&D uh, in Singapore in, in 2001 or something like that. So today we're networked back in again together. And I think that's another thing. You build human resources and friends in different places. And then when a, a new idea comes along, then you could connect with them and, and make that happen. Yeah, I think for everybody that knows the Singapore ecosystem, there's a huge amount of resource in education, in science, plenty of investment capital, great talent. It's just a question of getting on and doing some of these things. So making that leap from research to reality, from research to forming a company can be tricky. As you've looked at Singapore, you've been here now and involved for 20 plus years, um, where do you think we stand at the moment as Singapore and then broadly the larger set of ecosystems? What's the role of Asia now? So, so one thing I want to say, I'll invert it a little bit. I'll talk about the world first, which is that, um, so I think we're in a big reset actually. I think that the uh, connection between R&D and the marketplace is uh, at, at, at the worst it's been uh, for, for 30 or 40 years actually. And I saw it grow that way. Now one reason I'm in Singapore is that it's a smaller place that has to solve this problem. And, and so you can see things gathering momentum here to try to make that connection better, and, and, and we're passionate and know how to do that. So, so I think the opportunity in Singapore is that there's a concentration of resources with a need to solve this problem faster than anywhere else. And, and so um, that's why I'm excited. We've just, uh, in SMART, we have an innovation center that is meant to uh, link all of our research together with, with outside groups in the ecosystem, including Steve's organization. And so, uh, you know, that doesn't really exist anywhere else. So I think everybody in the world has figured out, yeah, we can create scientists and we can invest long term. And by the way, in, in 1900, that was not known, by the way. There was a guy named Vannevar Bush, who was an MIT dean, that said the nation state should invest in research, right? So it's a, it's a relatively new concept on a 100-year scale. And, and so now everybody's realizing this, but the next step, the challenge, which is, you know, well, how, do, how does that work? If they're isolated, clearly the chances of bringing that technology to market are, are pretty small. So, okay, they can't be isolated, but if you, if you put all sorts of KPIs on them, then for sure you're just gonna get what you have today because KPIs are based on what we know about today, right? So that's the big challenge, which is how do you actually, you know, do it, you know, what I would say is efficient innovation, and I'm defining innovation as um, idea all the way to embodiment in the marketplace, right? So that, that's how we think of innovation. Okay, I'm gonna take a risk and see if anybody would like to ask a question, because this is always the tricky bit when you look out at the audience and everybody's sort of sitting there, sitting there. So does anybody have a question? Yes, please. Hi, give me a moment, I'm coming with oh, the mic. Yeah. There we go. So thank you very much. You were talking about opportunities in Singapore. What would you say that are the big challenges uh, that you see in, in Singapore, like taking uh, entrepreneurs and growing and scaling up to the unicorns? <laughs> you, you want well, to yeah, I'll, I'll just take one minute on, on my perspective, and then obviously Eugene. Uh, for, first of all, from from my perspective, I spend this much time thinking about unicorns because I think more about whether there's value and it will be defined in different ways. I mean, unicorn obviously is one way of thinking about it. I like to argue the point that I don't personally think Snapchat was 48 times more valuable than DeepMind, but DeepMind went out at roughly 500 million and Snapchat roughly 24 billion. So from my perspective, I try and think about impact. Number two, is I think our biggest challenge 
is not resource, it's not investment money, it's not access to talent, it's not, not, not. What it is is mindset. At least for us in Singapore, the idea is it's okay to move from an environment in which research is highly valued and prioritized, and it's okay to try and build something. It's not a loss of face, it's not a, you know, it's not a, an ashamed thing. So for me, I have met amazing people and I know that we can build amazing things. The challenge is that idea that it's okay to try. It's, okay, it's more okay to try in some other markets, I would argue. And so our big goal is how can we try and give confidence and courage to those that would like to do it. So for everybody that argues the market's not big enough, we don't have enough talent, I hear the exact same thing in Israel, for example, that says we wish we had more people in this category. Even in China, I've heard entrepreneurs say, I don't want to be limited to the China market, I want to be bigger. So I think it's really just how we look at things. Yeah, so, so I think more of the challenges are, are, are the world challenges in every environment, which, um, you know, so let's take the, this chain that I was talking about. So on the research side, um, there was a narrative that was built after large enterprise stopped investing in the future, right? I mean, large enterprise, generally speaking, most of the companies, except for like Google, you know, are quarter to quarter companies, right? And so by pulling back there, um, it's very difficult to interact with corporations when you have an early product that, that they could take advantage of for the future because they're just not thinking that far in the future. So that's a systemic problem for everyone. Um, and, and what that does is on the university side, because disconnected, we sold this narrative that universities by themselves create entire uh, pieces of economy or something like that. If you go back and look at US history, it's completely untrue, right? So um, it's because they're in an ecosystem. MIT is famous because it creates students that um, um, have early experience uh, in this kind of process and they go out into an ecosystem that they can take advantage of, right? So I think, I think on the university side, the investment and funding is completely disconnected from where value could be. So these are the big challenges, and the question is how do you start processes that can bridge uh, that gap? Specific to Singapore, um, I, I, those are so overwhelming that uh, I, I don't think it's that different here. You know, I, I, I'd have to wait until, you know, when we can really uh, do this in an even more efficient way, what are the, the next challenges? I think on the other side of the Singapore would be a better place because of the reasons I mentioned before. Yeah, I mean, Singapore has all the raw materials. Number one in this, number one in that, number two in this doesn't matter, right? It's just this idea that can, must, and will, right? Israelis don't build for Israel. Nobody in San Francisco builds for Northern California, right? It just, it's kind of like that. Uh, is there another question that we can try and tackle? Yes, please. So I, I speak from the perspective of a SME. So I uh, run an R&D center in SME. Um, not the biggest company, but um, so I look at SE Innovate. And um, we have some of the technology we have. And, and as, so my question is, how do we work with your guys? Um, you know, to bridge the gap, right? I, um, like, in what way I think you might to share with us? Thanks. Okay, uh, without trying to make it about SG Innovate, what I'm gonna do is, my email is steve at sginnovate.com, right? So, for everybody that wants to drop me a note. Whether we're the right team or whether ASTAR, because ASTAR has you know, a program to put research scientists into SMEs, whether it's Enterprise Singapore, I don't know. So the short answer is happy to chat. We, we can see, and if we're not the right team, maybe somebody that we're good friends with is. My board has EDB, ESG, GIC, Tomasic, right? So if it's not us, we'll know somebody that can help and obviously our friends over at SMART. So drop me a note. Uh, other questions that we can tackle? And there's one over there. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, you know, I was really heartened when I saw up on the main stage earlier that uh, Airbus, when they were trying to find new quantum uh, solutions for their industry, they put the question out to the marketplace. And it made me think, 
you know, in the university space, we're really good at doing deep tech. Uh, we're really good and are getting better at doing deep tech companies. But how do you think we get increased the likelihood of creating deep tech customers? And by that I mean, how do we get traditional large scale enterprise to understand how they can better integrate the deep tech uh, outputs that are coming out of universities, either by license through spin-offs or through startups? Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the challenge I was talking about. So what we've been doing at SMART is... Your, your uh, microphone, oh, Eugene, is because we're competing just closer to you so we can hear you better. Is that better? I'll just hold it. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, what we've been doing in SMART is creating programs from the beginning that have that folded into the process. So um, one of the things I think as researchers uh, we, we have to be aware of is that um, that conversation that you'll have with the outside world helps steer what you work on, right? So one of the dangers is to say, I have a fully polished thing and I know it's valuable and then I'm gonna go talk. So there's, there's two mm -hmm. sides to that equation, right? Mm -hmm. Now one is we all have areas of expertise, right? So we try to do is form programs where we say, look, there's, there's a really important problem where fundamental technology research needs to be done. It's so important that it intersects many, many, many markets. We can't tell yet because we haven't finished the research and we haven't, um, we haven't uh, identified the exact market, right? But that's different than me going further on deep tech by myself, right? So, so what I say is, all right, uh, we have this range of stuff we've got to do research on, but it's so important. There's many, many applications it could go into, right? And during that process, the way that I find out what those array of markets are, I talk to people, right? So we go talk to companies, and you know, the companies always the first time are gonna say, you know, um, well, you know, we're not really interested in that. You say, well, what are you interested in? And then if you thought they were interested, you must have a thesis for that. You say, well, what about this? What if this happens? What are you guys gonna do then? They're giving you so much val valuable information even though you're not funded yet, right? Because, you know, ultimately what you wanna do is take all the input from all these larger enterprises and then figure out how to do something better than they do, right? <laughs> so. So I think, I think you know, it's that process from the very beginning that steers your own research, and then all of a sudden you're there with something that's better, and then at the end you say, hey, you guys want to work with us to bring it to final stage, right? And then if they go, well, you know, now their processes are looking too close in, well, that's where there's these other mechanisms like you know, Innovation Center there or Steve, you know, they could say, all right, we got a better position than most of these companies, let's make a company. Right? So it's that iterative process the whole time. I think one thing is if you develop, uh, again, a piece of science too far without thinking that way, mm -hmm. it, it could be valuable, but you also could be in a desert by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the... Yeah, and I think one of the challenges on this are these problems which the company is understanding correctly. This idea of, of a company understanding its own goal and searching for a good outcome. So as an example, I used to be in storage industry, information storage. If you talk to a bank and you say, I can help you decrease latency so that you have now this response time compared to that response time, they can easily do the math and say, that allows me to execute a trade more quickly. I'm interested. But it's when the sort of deep tech or the tech overwhelms the business need. So it's that API that we struggle with. So part of what we're trying to do is help the scientists think about these things in business terms and the business think about them in outcomes terms. That is a, a continuing challenge. I think it's better for the company to understand their pain points more clearly. As a quick example, we have corporations coming to us all the time saying, show me some cool startups. And we always say, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And that's when most of the conversations sort of go off a cliff. Uh, one more question before I ask my own question of Eugene. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see there was a, and then I have a question in the front, please. Yes, please. Hi, I would like to check what's your view on the convergence of technology for healthcare sector like deep tech and healthcare, what do you think about it? 100%, 100%, I mean, I'm biased because, I mean, sorry, I should let my, my guest speak, but on this perspective, 100%, I don't see any future for healthcare that isn't 
more and more technology. It is already, as, as you would know, but I don't see any future in which it isn't more technology oriented, whether it's image detection, so CVPR, computer vision pattern recognition, whether it's trying to use algorithms to get to certain outcomes more quickly. I would even argue that there's going to be drug discovery with quantum computing trying to accelerate simulation. So I, I don't see any future in which it's not. I think the bigger question is legislation, ethics of use of data, insurance paradigms, because now I know something about you predictively and how do I insure you. Uh, we have an event on Monday at SG Innovate in which the chief medical scientist for Singapore is going to be talking about the convergence of AI and health. So that gives you a sense of it. Do you want to get the other? Yes, we're please. Outside. Hi. Um, yeah, my question is around uh, regional agenda for Singapore. So half of the fintech solutions, or not, a big majority of the fintech solutions are surrounding, say, financial inclusion, but there is no bank in Singapore. Uh, is it a must to, f um, how to build that, that, that um, agenda, that regional agenda from Singapore? The, well, we've tried to launch a lot of products here, uh, and it's not launched here. I'm from One Connect, by the way, and we're part of the Ping An Group. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to Eugene's earlier point, which is understand the market. I mean, if the market is inclusion, then Singapore is not the logical market, but Singapore is a logical place from which that market uh, can be grown, right? Singapore has a brand of trust with the MAS and others that Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia may not enjoy that same level. So I think there's always a great way to build from Singapore for larger markets. I think the challenge is, is the entrepreneur thinking about those other markets sufficiently. And if you're sitting in Singapore saying, how do I build for Indonesia, and you're not in Indonesia speaking with customers, then you're going to struggle. One thing about um, certain areas, if you're thinking of being an entrepreneurial person, um, there, there are certain advances that uh, are systemic. And what I mean by that is energy, um, the system of healthcare, that's not, I, I'm not including biotech um, molecular design and things like that in there, but there's these sort of systemic things. And as an entrepreneur, one of the difficulties is you have to sell something and you have to um, have margin to grow your company. I mean, right now you don't have to because of course you could lose money and do anything, but that day is coming to an end. If you don't believe so, just go back to the Bank of England and there's an average reversion to mean at 5% short-term interest rates, right? So, so forget about all this craziness. The reality is you have to make money, right? And so um, systemic things, making money in them is very difficult and to grow your business that way. So FinTech and, and again, systemic healthcare stuff extremely difficult because the whole system has to change for you to get that uh, innovation in there, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but that's where you need to work with large banks or you need to work with Singapore government or you need to, you need to work in a systemic way if you want to grow uh, those kind of businesses. You know, I, I think for, for scientists trying to do deep tech and become entrepreneurs, it's much easier if you you, you, you have this piece of gold and just everybody wants the gold intrinsically and I don't have to change the world. Somebody will come buy my piece of gold, right? That's, those are much easier. Now, it turns out those things are harder on the science side, but they're much easier on the business side, right? So just something to keep in mind. It's one of those funny conundrums in tech that the more money you lose, it seems like the greater your valuation, right? If you take a look at the companies that have gone public, they're all hemorrhaging. Everybody was thrilled when Uber only lost a billion dollars in the last quarter. Uh, okay, we're, we're at the end of time. Please take away from this that SMART, under Eugene's leadership, trying to think about the intersection of science and bringing that science to fruition in a way that it has a meaningful impact in society. So Eugene's available and his team is available. SG Innovate, we try and help entrepreneurial scientists. Singapore has a lot of the raw materials to do amazing things. We have to think beyond Singapore in order to try and do those amazing things. So if you're interested, there's a big deep tech summit, November 14th, in which it's going to be a thousand plus scientists and entrepreneurs trying to tackle some of these really hard questions if you're interested to go deeper. Thanks for being a part of it today, thanks.
Thank you so much to Steve and Eugene for their insights.